Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in our chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast, part of the Bitcoin Podcast Network. This is episode 137, and I am your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, D. Host number three, Corey, coming at you. What's up, guys? How was your week? Oh, I mean, my week was good. I just want to re—I always want to rewind the clock a little bit. Cello was like part of the Bitcoin Podcast Network. This is the flagship show, right? This is, is the, the flagship show. This is the the Nina, right? Which Nina, one was the flagship Pinta, of the three? Santa Maria. I think Santa Maria was the tiny one in the back, right? And I'm I'm, I'm like I'm old enough now to know this is fifty percent true. All of that history I know about Christopher Columbus, but I think it was the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Marina, the Santa Maria. What I'm was the ship that had the least slaves on it? Because that's that's us. I don't want to be the ship that had the most slaves on it. I don't think those three ships had slaves on it. They were coming from Spain. They were Puritans, right? It was just spices and tobacco. Uh, and STDs and stuff. All right. They they, they brought diseases. But um, this, is, this is the show that started started it all. The Nina was Columbus's yeah, this- favorite. And for good reason, according to this website, thenina.com. <laughs> it's actually, there is the thenina.com. So, wow. Yeah, well, yeah, of course, true. the Nina.com is going to favor the Nina. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not going to read that. Reminds me, oh, that reminds me of when we watched, uh, what's that show True on Blood. HBO with the vampires? True Blood. True Blood. Like, this is, all right, audience, sorry, be patient. We're going to talk about Bitcoin and crypto, but this is a funny story. So, Corey and the rest of us, watching True Blood, because it came on after Entourage. And we had way too much money in college and watched the hell out of HBO. So we were watching Entourage and it's True Blood. And we watched this terrible ass show. And we're like, this is the worst vampire show ever. Don't even don't even the, give it a, a moniker of a vampire show. It was just the worst show. It was so bad. And then the next episode, the next week it comes on again, but we're too lazy to like change the channel or get up. So we watch it again. And then they do this special where it's like, this is all the crazy, awesome stuff people are saying about True Blood. And we're like, what? People like this shit? And the like very first comment was, True Blood is the greatest show ever. And this was quoted by someone, and their handle was like, Vampire Lover 9000 or something. <laughs> <laughs> like all of the reviews were like from you know Bloodsucker sixty two Vampire Lover five thousand, and that was the funniest. And because that was so funny, I think I almost like died laughing. We ended up becoming big fans of the show after that, and like watching it every week, pretty much. Watch the whole thing. I thought it was really cool how vampires explode when you stab them in the heart, turn into red jello. It's cool. Anyway. That was a hey, cool. That was a good story. Hey, I, so I've been working from home all week. I promise we're gonna get the Bitcoin. And uh, I was browsing the internet because I got a lot of time, and I found out that in 1994, Vin Diesel was selling street sharks at a toy fair. Yes, he was. And you did you see the video? Yeah, he wore a leather vest while he was doing it. Yep. That was shortly after his breakdancing instructional video. That's the Vin Diesel I Body. Miss. Body grooving. And he says, I don't have friends. I got family. Also shark toys. I have several shark toys. He's been saying emotional quotes since the dawn of time. Yeah. (laughs) 
one starts to wonder like what the documentary or biopic on Vin Diesel is going to be like. Like what was going on in his household? <laughs> what was it about? Heavily supported with emotional quotes of some sort because he, he's been regurgitating him his whole life. The best picture on the internet is a picture of a horse on the beach going into the ocean with Vin Diesel's face in the clouds. Look right, that up. Let's, let's, we we, we got to stop. We got to go. We got to go. Okay, so. All right. Oh, 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 hold on, hold on. So all this, I, let me get to this ad real quick. Cause <laughs> no, man. Let's do the, no, let's do the ad later because we just had people suffer through. 75% a listener drop. Personal story. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're losing listeners at a rapid rate. So let's, let's like, let's talk about bitcoin so there's two things that we wanted to talk about today with you guys uh, in particular that we feel are really important to get into the ether no pun intended slightly intended well, this is a uh, question every time someone joins our slack lately they say what yeah. do i do on august 1st what do i do on august 1st is there going to be a bitcoin fork what the fork is going on um do is my money going to be gone is crypto over is the planet going to melt? And I'm like, whoa, 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 that's a bit dramatic. None of that actually happens. But people are asking us the question. So we thought we would start to give you the answers that, on this show that you're listening to. All right. So we're going to run this by Corey. Corey, are you there? Yeah. I'm a noob, right? And I just got a Bitcoin wallet through Coinbase. And I'm like, oh, it's so cool. Like, I bought $100 worth, and now it's worth $102. It's crazy. It's just like they say, I'm going to be rich. What was the sport? Um, excuse me, Dr. Petty. Like, there's a fort coming. What do I need to do to prepare myself for the end of days? Hmm. How do I start this? So, first off, if you're ultra noobish and you've purchased some Bitcoin. We're only talking about Bitcoin here in terms of what you should you do about the upcoming events that are happen they're starting to happen on August first. Is if you're if you have no idea what's going on, then and you only have money on Coinbase, I'd say leave your money on Coinbase. You're better off just letting them decide what to do with your money. Cause if you're that noobish and you have no idea what's going on, I'm not terribly sure moving your money over and then figuring out what to do if there is a fork that happens later on. Coinbase has said that when a fork happens, if it happens, they'll probably shut down for 24 hours or so in order to figure out how to best serve their customers. Now, based on their previous customer support, it'll probably take longer than 24 hours, but they will make sure you have at least your money, your amount of your amount of Bitcoin. That being said, <clears throat> if you would like to secure your private keys, I would recommend doing that if you're savvy enough to understand what, what a fork is. So if you own your own private keys, no matter what happens to the Bitcoin network, if it forks into multiple multiple networks, then you can load your private keys back on each of the networks because you own your private keys, which means you own your Bitcoin. If you leave your money or your, your Bitcoins and your private keys on, on a service, on an exchange like Coinbase or Poloniex or some other exchange or Kraken or whatever it is, then you're relegated to the choices they make and decide they'd like to do when and if a fork happens, which means that you don't get a choice if they decide they don't want to support one of the chains and you would like to. If you own your own private keys and the Bitcoin network forks, then you have new Bitcoin on every single one of those networks. So say, for instance, the Bitcoin forks into, into two different chains and you had, you had one Bitcoin. You now have one Bitcoin on the new chain, one Bitcoin on the old chain. And depending on which chain wins over time, then you, you, have, you still have both of those coins regardless of whatever, whatever happens because you own your private keys. If... For some reason, you would like to have your Bitcoin on, on the chain that loses, and you left your money on one of these custodial services like like Coinbase, and they decide they don't want to support that chain, then you don't own that Bitcoin anymore. So the bottom line is, if you want to have the most decisions on what to do 
when and if something happens. You need to at least own your private keys, which means you can't be on a third-party service like Coinbase or an exchange. You need to use a, use a wallet like Airbits, use a wallet like Jax, Red Wallet, things like this, where you own, you own the private key. Or a paper wallet. If you're not comfortable with doing that type of stuff, and you have no idea what's going on, and you just got in, you're ultra noobish, leave it alone, wait for the dust to settle, and hope you have just as much money as you had beforehand. Ooh, hope is not a plan, Corey. Ah, uh, well, you shouldn't be in this space if you don't know what's going on. No, that's not true. That if you should not be putting, see. you should not be putting a shitload of money in this space if you don't know what's going on. That's my personal opinion. This is a, this is a what, really okay. new that's, nascent that's network. A much, that's a much better oh, way to yeah, state for it. Sure. Than, we we say we say should. that all the time in terms of investing and speculating, right? Don't put money in that you're not willing to lose. Well, guess what? This is one of those scenarios where you think you might lose some money. Yep. Yeah, but what if somebody has put a small amount of their paycheck into crypto since 2012? They have they've put in a shitload of money over time, but they're still don't understand then, August 1st. Then I don't and, I would say they don't know how to invest if they're not looking into the things they're investing in for that long of a time. Exactly. I mean, if if also if they have a shitload of money, then and, and you're not willing to lose that money, then take it out. This is what I say. If you do not, if you're, this is just a general investing tip, right? Okay, so for all you guys that hang around in r slash investing, everybody that gets investing tips, this is D.E. Ferguson's investing tip of the day, and this is what I mean. If you do not know the core principles of the things that you're invested in, and the foundations of what the things you're invested in do and how they function, then you need to take all your money out of that shit and you need to go to Vegas and you need to start playing roulette because you're basically doing the same thing. And I, I don't know if it's that that harsh, right? It's I mean, they're investing in a technology Corey, whoa, that man, will, you just will took be good over the time. Whole, that was some dramatic ass buildup that I had, I and you shit. just destroyed it. Like, I'll turn on. If this were a Scorsese movie, if I were Scorsese, like I'd yell cut. Just destroy that whole moment. Scorsese. Scorsese? <laughs> Scorsese. Are you saying Scorsese? Sezzy. Says Sezzy. I'll, I'll take well, the guy that ran the, the the movie critic website for a long time. I'll take his opinion. <laughs> anyway, like so So then it's Patrick Sezzy? Or Patrick what? Swayze. It's completely Patrick different. Patrick Swayze. That's different, different origins of country, different spelling. <laughs> Sezzy. Scorsese. Scorsese. Anyway, that, that's I, like I want to get back to this. I want to get back to this. It's, it, Wait, let me get my take. Wait, right, do you have something ahead. to add to D? No, go ahead. Get your take. All right. Me, personally, I held Bitcoin through... Every up and down since D and Corey introduced me into the scene, which was 2013. And at every down move or bit of drama, I would ask myself, is there a fundamental problem with Bitcoin itself or is there just some passing issue? And every time the answer was never a fundamental problem with Bitcoin itself. So I held until this year. And this year, an odd thing happened where the price was moving up, but there was a fundamental problem with Bitcoin itself. And it had been Whoa. taken over by by its saboteurs and its growth and technical wait, progress wait, 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 stopped. Wait, wait, wait. wait, before we go down that road, what's the fundamental problem with Bitcoin? The tech. What's the problem with it? The community and the businesses started being No, 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 no. No, the, the, the actual tech. Is our transactions not being confirmed? Some would say. Fees. The backlog, the fee, the fee market is, I would say, an artificially inflated fee market. The spam, like the, the politics around Bitcoin have made it not as functional as what it could be. And as well as stop has stagnated the development of the technology. No, I think that's a slippery slope. I oh, think it's okay. a slippery slope to start pointing politics to the actual functionality of OG. I'm just giving you my take. Okay, that's well, here we have this. Because of all of these politics, there is a potential fork, a very likelihood of a fork 
in the foreground, which hasn't happened since we've started in this space. There has not been a hard fork since we've started. False. Oh, well, since we've started. Oh, okay. Yes, a contentious true. hard fork since we've started. Which means that's we true. have not dealt with this issue since we've started in this space. We have and not. We need to reevaluate how we do things because this is something we haven't dealt with. And all likelihood, if I take my experience with Ethereum, which wasn't nearly as contentious, they had a 90 10 network split when they had a hard fork because of an ideology, ideological difference in the way the two chains left. The people who didn't like the idea of them changing the history of the state of Ethereum split off into a different chain. And it stayed alive, despite no one thinking it would. And it still, it still exists today. There's people building on it. And when that happened, the price dropped drastically because a, few, a lot of people lost confidence in the underlying technology. Now, if we take that experience and make the same analogy to Bitcoin, even if we have a 90-10 split of ideology, which I think will probably be larger in my personal opinion, then we'll have at least a short-term price drop and then an eventual, hopefully, price come back up as people start to realize that people, your, people are still building, people are still using, so on and so forth. It may, in, over the long term, be really good for Bitcoin for it to split like this. So that people, each side, each faction gets what they want. Or it couldn't be. We don't know because it's, it's so, there's, so, there's so much contention around it. So if you're in, in it for the long haul and you're and you're saying you're looking five years out, get your private keys, put your Bitcoin on the addresses associated with those private keys, and hold on and watch watch the shit show, and hope. But other than that, there's nothing we can really say. Do we have you, any advice? My, I don't know. It, 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 it depends. No, if you don't have risk, the private right? keys, you don't. Here's my advice. If you don't have the private keys, you don't have the currency. We've 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 been saying that mantra since we started, and that's Can we're we... always going to say that damn mantra because that's ultimately what it takes. Even if there is a split, load your private keys on both of the coins. Now, I will say I want to get somebody on the show, maybe next week, um, to have a conversation solely about what Wait, did users I, could can, can possibly you do what expect. I just said? What'd you Can you say? do what I just said? What'd you say? If there's a split, just load your private keys on both of the both yeah, of the chains. Yeah, that's what I said earlier. That's what you do. It's, okay, it's... cool. All right. I've been drinking. I got some wine in my system. Fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm hoping to get somebody on the show next week so we can talk about potential futures of what can happen with all of these different different options of people trying to load SegWit, counter hard forks, User activated soft works, spec, you know, BIP 148, all these different things you hear about that's going to be happening starting August 1st. I want to get somebody on the show that knows a lot more about it than we do to, to help walk us through some of these things so that the audience can understand. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey, what, exactly what Corey's saying. If you're listening right now, you know, let's try, let's try and get some traction. Let's get a powerhouse guest on the show to basically verify everything we've said or validate the things that we've said and maybe give you a little better idea of what you need to do prior to August 1st to make sure that your money ain't funny. Well, it's, it's one of these things, right? Like we can't tell everybody what to do because everybody's situation is not like ours. The only, only thing we can do is provide information so people can make better decisions for themselves. And so if we, someone's asking us, how do, how do I, how should I invest? Are you guys not comfortable? No, I'm not. I don't know. That. I don't know. That's, I don't. A, I can't tell someone one, how to invest. No, no. no. I, I'm shop to get in your ass sued. No, if so, <laughs> if I'm listening to the show and I'm like, man, Corey's such a smart guy. I've been listening to him for two years. Dimitri is such a great guy. I've been listening to him two years. I wonder how they're allocating their money. Is there any transparency that we can give our listeners to how we're doing it, where we're not held accountable? We're just, you know, giving them kind of a. I've talked about that frame. before. Previous shows. I mean, I I have. Okay. Certain allocations. So, the majority so Corey, of what are, I have. Go ahead. Do what? you buy in the Ethereum after such a massive move? Do you continue to hold and hope somehow the SegWit fork will eventually succeed and core will finally be bypassed? Do I divest? Do I allocate 20% Bitcoin, 50% Ethereum, the rest in other alts? 
What do I do? What I are you guys doing? I don't know. There's no one stop shop here. My, me personally, I, I don't even know what I'm going to do. I'm still trying to figure it out. There, that, that's I, a good answer. That's a good answer. I know what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to tell you. Well, I, I'll tell you the answer, Cello. If your name, if your last name is Ferguson and you're black, there's a good percentage that you might be related to me. I'll be transparent. I'll let you know what I'm doing. If you're married to someone whose last name is Ferguson and they're black, then I'll be transparent. I'll let you know. If you're not family or that damn close, I'm not giving you investing advice. I'm not trying to get sued. I'm not saying this is advice, though. <laughs> I'm saying people might be listening to the show and they might be wondering how we are acting in this scenario. You know, how is Demetra Corey and Cello dealing with this looming Ethereum flip? How are I'm they going cool to prepare? A, I'm cool as a fucking cucumber, man. Oh, I got, I, what do you mean? I mean, one, this whole flip, this, okay, I want to. I'm gonna put my I'm gonna put my fist down on the table, and take my glasses off and point them. There's no flipping, and that the, what the community needs to realize is that it's not a damn zero sum game. It's not. If, it, if there's someone out there that thinks that there's one network that's to rule them all, one network that's gonna do all the things, that's stupid. That's a stupid thought to have. And, and I'm I'm saying that, and I'm being really harsh about it because one, it's like it's physically hard to do with the way the hardware is designed nowadays. And I don't see profitability and all of a sudden changing the whole design so one network can rule them all. The ideal situation is that different networks have very highly specialized functions, and they can communicate each other when they need to. do the things that they need to do but this whole ethereum is going to take over bitcoin bitcoin's going to rule them all once rootstock comes no one's going to need ethereum this is all dumb stuff this is all dumb talk it's really good that there's specialized focus and uh, a brain trust in these areas that's great but at the bottom at the very end of the day they're going to have to communicate with each other so the chain interoperability that's that's going to be the more realistic version of how all this stuff scales out. Not one network ruling them all. So this whole flipping that's garbage. That's stupid. And it sounds like an M. Night Shyamalan movie. I will say there is, there is value to the, a market cap overtaking the market cap of Bitcoin. Which, which well, in my opinion, shows that it can happen. Because for the longest time, no one ever thought that was it would ever happen. It was just going to be Bitcoin being the main dominant storage of value, largest market cap, where everyone goes, like basically the funnel in which everyone goes through to get to all these other coins. Ethereum came really close to overtaking the market cap for a small amount of time of Bitcoin. And if that were to happen, then it would show that that's not necessarily the case. And we'll probably end up in the future that you just that you just pointed out, where we have this kind of large array of different assets that are specialized in different ways and we use them for what they're good for instead of having one large thing that then branches out into all these smaller things and like that so there's there's value in that type of stuff happening but a lot of people take it too far and saying you know like if ethereum overtakes the market cap of bitcoin then bitcoin's doomed to fail and all this other stuff and that's all what you said that's all garbage do, do do we have we ever sat, sat and thought back how much money has been invested in Bitcoin success? Like, there's a lot of people with deep pockets that are gonna put the pressure on success of Bitcoin. I'd say the same thing right? for Ethereum. Like, the same thing is for Ethereum, right? But here's there's there's a reason why things get definitions and then they get placed into a box where they have ultimate domain. Proof of work is a very beautiful consensus algorithm for what it's proved for the past nine years. And that's storage of value and unit of account. All the very next level smart contracts. and I'm just going to say smart contracts. It's the only thing I can think about with this wine's hitting me. That's a very good thing that Ethereum has a handle on. I mean... 
if Bitcoin's not broken, why try to force it to be something it's not? What does that have to do with bit proof of work, though? Well, proof of share, right? Isn't that what, isn't that what the no. Ethereum is going to? Ethereum is trying to move to proof of stake, which gets rid of... Proof of stake. Which, proof of stake. I'm sorry. I've been drinking. They're slowly, they're slowly testing out, trying to find an algorithm that works that's fair, that incentivizes the people who are validating the network properly so that you can't collude to take control over the network. See, and that's a very computational power. The very tough thing to do. Oh, I, I sure. ultimately think is is the only thing that they're doing with proof of stake is because Bitcoin is so resource dependent. Like it's no. the, the energy. That's not the only reason. That is one of the reasons. Some people like to take that reason and run with it, but there are plenty of other reasons why you would want to switch to proof of stake. Stake, and that usually has to do with scale. You can have very quick. Um, finality of a block so you don't have to wait for confirmation times in some versions of proof of stake you can penalize those that that cheat the system in a provable way and it's much easier to see who's cheated the system because you you've people have bonded a good amount of money to the system in order to become validators if you can prove that they have cheated the system then you can just take all their money away and there's nothing they can do about it so it, it, it the, getting the incentive the incentives to follow the rules and proper disincentives when you cheat the system allows you to trust that people will follow the rules because it's within their economic benefit. So, so that's, basically, it's, that's a difficult thing to do, but it allows you to do things much, much faster. You can have more transactions per second. You can have faster block times and a quicker finality of a block. This is what I hear with proof of stake. They're trying really, and they're trying to be really meticulous about making the perfect Monopoly board game. That's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic game theory. Because you can't cheat in Monopoly. The only way to cheat Monopoly is to be the banker and take the money while no one's looking. But if you put that money in a place, everyone sees it, and somebody has to reach in there to get it, there's like no cheating in Monopoly. Zero cheating. If that's how you want to look at it, yeah. So it, and it gets, it gets deep, right? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in the research of Proof of Stake. We just don't know if it works at scale yet. And there's a lot of different ways people are trying to do it. So people who say proof of stake is garbage, I don't think have looked into it enough. And, but we don't know if it's going to work until we use it and have experience with okay. it. So here's the funny question. I've cheated a Monopoly before. <laughs> How? 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 I want to know. Put it out there. People weren't looking and he put like houses on his property? No, it's, I got And we're back from discussing my illegal activities. <laughs> Sorry, you got to hear that long beep. All right, we're brought to you by uh, Athena Bitcoin, the most trusted name in Bitcoin ATMs in H Town, Fort Worth, and Dallas, and a bunch of other cities. I think they're up to about ten or eleven or twelve. Anyway, download the Athena Bitcoin wallet on the App Store or Google Play. And for those specific locations and more, visit athenabitcoin.com. And we're also brought to you by Athena Bitcoin's portfolio company, bitquick.co, which is the quick and easy peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin marketplace where you can get Bitcoin for cash in as little as three hours. Bitquick has been serving Bitcoiners since 2013. And then I want to add something because escrow my bits was a – they were a past sponsor of ours. And then I don't think it hit us until like 60 episodes later that maybe some of our listeners don't know what escrow is. So I understand that cryptocurrency is a brand new technology and it requires some time and effort and a lot of questions to understand. And we've tried to make the process of purchasing and using Bitcoin and Litecoin as straightforward as possible. But there's always going to be moments when you need some extra help. So for Athena Bitcoin customers, you can now direct all your questions to them. You can either call them or send them a text message at 312-690-4466, or you can email support at athenabitcoin.com, and they'll take care of you. Hollow. They like that. Nice. Hollow. Wait, did, did, do I do the jingle? It's bit quick. Get your bits quick. quick. It's the man, most trusted ATM. That's such a great jingle, man. Like I think that I think they should pay me for that. 
They do. That's what <laughs> they are. <laughs> oh yeah, right. They, they literally do. Damn. All right, you guys want to throw the interview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, man. It's been two years. We got Jonathan Chester from Bitwage. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Bitwage, they focus on international payroll markets, and they, they are do. now expanding its European footprint with a launch in the UK. So he wanted to come on the show and talk about that. So if you're in the UK and you're listening to us and you want to use Bitwage, uh, well, the stars have aligned. This shit's for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> this shit's for you, yo. This shit is for you. All right. Here it is. All right, guys. Way back. On episode 15, Jonathan came on the show to talk about BitWage. We're, we were excited to have him on because it allowed you to receive part of your paycheck in Bitcoin, even if you know, your employer doesn't offer the option. And you might be asking, like, what kind of employers? Do you mean, like, mom and pop? No, nope, I'm talking, like, Uber, Google, Airbnb, Facebook, you name it. They have over 13,000 registered workers. Uh, first off, you know, I want to say thanks because... You know, back then you gave your time to a new podcast, and at that time, that's that's something, man, because you don't know if a show is going to stick around, if there's a big listenership. So, uh, Jonathan, I appreciate your time then, and I certainly appreciate your time now. So, thanks for being on the show again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks, thanks for having me. You know, I think uh, I think that we were both uh, a little bit young in our in our ventures back then, so uh, it, was, it was good to be on back then as well. Yeah, it's cool to have a show where I can like actually keep tabs on someone and check in like two years later. So, um, you know, tell us a bit, a little bit about, you know, what's been going on the last few years and I don't know whether it's, you know, personal development, maybe your thoughts on crypto, if if it's changed, et cetera, just, you know, I guess catch the listeners up a little bit. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I guess since, since then, uh, there's two, there's two, two main, uh, things to talk about. Um, the, the shortest one to talk about is more personal. Um, I've, I've become a, a contributor on Forbes. Uh, for all things Bitcoin and, and blockchain related. So uh, I get to write about that, although uh, I'm not allowed to really talk about any uh, announcements that are happening uh, with BitWage in my, in my Forbes articles. But I do that and I, I sort of get to talk about my, my muses on Bitcoin and blockchain as long as politically correct. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's been uh, pretty wild. But on, on the other side, obviously there's BitWage, which now it's almost it's almost three years, uh, just about three years now. Uh, we started when did we start? We started in May of 2014, so it's been over over three years since we started. And I mean, a lot's been a lot's been going on. I think two years ago uh, was even before we had we had raised any funds as a company, um, and since that time. You know, we've raised close to a million dollars with Draper Associates. So it's uh, Tim, Tim Draper who sort of la- leads that. Uh, and I've gotten money from a series of angels and VCs, uh, got money through uh, Orange uh, Fab, which is the Orange Telecom's Silicon Valley Accelerator. And most recently, you're catching me in Paris right now, where we received a grant from the French government as part of this this um, this uh, attempt by the French government to bring international companies uh, into France called the French Tech Ticket, um, and uh, it's pretty interesting because I think they're especially excited about it uh, as a result of Brexit right now, mainly because they see it as an opportunity to dethrone uh, London as the center for startups, and so they're putting a lot of money into French tech. Uh, Macron, the new president. I just, I just saw the guy walking around at the startup conference Viva Technology. He gave a talk. Pretty inspiring guy. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, there's there's this new exciting uh, space, co-working space called Station F that's about to get launched. You know, uh, that was funded by some eccentric billionaire uh, who. Uh, created a, a new telco not too long ago in, in France, and they're going to be hosting uh, a thousand startups from around the world at this place, which we're going to 
we're going to get to be a part of. So a lot's, a lot's been happening here. Um, and you know, to, to say the least bit wage growth has been, has been doing well. Um, and for, for all the listeners that don't understand or know what, what we do over a bit wage is you sign up and, um, you know, our, our core solution, we call it Bitwage invoicing, but it can be used as an employee or for payroll, what have you. But you sign up, we provide you with a, a local bank account in the U.S., in the EU, and uh, this coming Monday, or, or rather this pe- the past Monday, uh, it's, it's, it's a little uh, odd because I'm talking about this maybe a week <laughs> before you're going to hear it, but, um, but yeah, so... Uh, past, this past Monday, we just launched uh, the ability to also have bank accounts in the UK. So what, what do you do with these bank accounts once you have them? Uh, you can provide them to your employer essentially as a, a Bitcoin direct deposit, right? So you work for Google, you work for Facebook, maybe you're a freelancer working for Upwork or Topdol, uh, even working for like the US Navy or the United Nations. You present them with this direct deposit account, they pay funds into the account, the, the company, not necessarily needing to know that you're going to be receiving Bitcoin on the other end. Um, and then those funds get converted into Bitcoin uh, and deposited into your account. And what's nice about it is you can choose whatever percentage. It doesn't have to be 100%. You can choose any percentage either at the payroll provider level with your employer, or if they don't offer that, on our level now too, which is something that uh, we did not offer before percentage directly on our platform. So lots been going on. Yeah, uh, we can dig. We could probably make a show out of each of those separate things you just talked about. So I, I, I want to I want to start with kind of digging in the obvious question that you've probably answered a thousand times. Um, why? How can people trust you with that hmm. bank account? How does that bank account work in terms of trust? Because the, as we all know, this whole space is very dedicated upon not trusting anybody or not having to trust anybody. But obviously, if they're using your services, there's a certain amount of trust that they're putting with you into placing their money in your hands for a given amount of time. Um, what, what, what safeguards do you have to protect the, the, your users? Well, there's no different trust that you would have to have in us than you would, you know, uh, perhaps in an exchange or mm-hmm. a wallet provider that exists out there. Uh, albeit there is one small difference, which is that we, are purely transactional. We, you don't hold your money with us. So the time uh, and risk of basically us getting hacked is very momentary, right? We don't even hold, we don't even hold Bitcoin. So, um, so because of that, there's really just a very short risk time period at which, at which um, your money is at risk, which I'm not going to explain what time that is because obviously that's, yeah. Yeah. Not very secure, but <laughs> but uh, but essentially, there's a very short time period that it's that that your money's at risk, and during that time, uh, and, and right after that time, the money's in your wallet, right? Unlike you, you know, what's uh, an exchange where you you buy the coins on the exchange and you're holding it on the exchange. The exchange gets gets hacked before you move the money off the platform. You have a risk of losing some of your money, or if uh, the system isn't uh, isn't secure enough, uh, or you, you, you don't make it secure enough. Someone might do like an SMS porting hack, pull your money by just getting your account details yourself. But on our system there, uh, because you put in a, a wallet off the platform, money comes into us, basically gets converted to Bitcoin and it's set away from us. So we're not even that big of a target because we don't hold that much money uh, in, in Bitcoin at any given time. A lot of, a lot of times we'll, most of the time we hold zero Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, unlike a lot of these other services, we actually recently developed an in-house, uh, uh TOTP login mechanism in, in our iOS and Android bit, uh, Bitwage apps, which essentially allows you to log in by clicking okay on the app. Um, uh, after putting in your, your login and password, the 2FA. Uh, and this is a protection against the SMS porting hack, um, mm-hmm. and, and uh, which we feel very, you know, very strongly uh, is a, a major issue within the, within the community right now. Um, 
you know, besides that, I mean, we've done $22 million in transactions. We've got 13,000 people that trust us. Um, and, uh, we've got errors in emissions and cyber liability insurance from, uh, one of the top, uh, insurance agencies. Um, and we've been around for three years. So, um, you know, if, if, if you, you can't trust the system, uh, based on, on, on those metrics, then, uh, then, uh, you know, probably not too many Bitcoin companies out there that you can, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just, yeah, now, now that we got that out of the way, it's, this is something that I think we have, I, I should ask just based on people who are getting introduced to your, your platform to, so that they're much more comfortable getting started and, and joining you without having to try and figure that stuff out themselves. But on to more interesting things, in my opinion, how do you stay politically correct with Forbes? Like, what, what does that <laughs> do mean? Say, what does that mean, actually? Well, I mean, it depends on, it depends on how, how controversial you want to be. I mean, you know, you sometimes... Sometimes, so it's interesting. Talk about the process a little bit. Um, so I, I basically have free la- free reign as long as I stay within my swim lane, which is like Bitcoin and blockchain as it pertains to startups and entrepreneurship, mm. which is like everything happening lane. in Bitcoin and blockchain. <laughs> that's, that's a wide lane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, so the uh, uh, usually you know, no one, no one basically tells me to do this or to do that, uh, except for sometimes I'll log in and they'll say, you know, uh, uh, you know, this big political figure said this and whatever you do, don't comment about it. Right. Um, and, uh, other than that, which almost usually doesn't, doesn't affect me. Um, I I've got free reign. That being said, um, you know, there there are certain concepts that I that I that I think about in the crypto space that are uh, more are, are are closer to the 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 Bitcoin maximalist side, you might say, um, than what the Forbes readers want Forbes readers want to want to read. So I'll branch out and I'll, I'll sort of write and give the benefit of the doubt to uh, you know basically other other types of blockchains like private blockchains uh, and other and other other cryptos that might have a, a big following but um, but I guess you know if I were to write a medium post as opposed to a Forbes a Forbes article it'd be more Bitcoin maximalist based thing I see and did, yeah. did, did like Laura Shin kind of like pave the way for more blockchain reporters to join Forbes was she like the first or is there like some kind of cross pollination where you can like collaborate with her. How does that work? Uh, okay. So I, I barely, uh, know Laura to be perfectly honest. Um, so she is, she is like the, she's like the paid reporter, uh, at Forbes whose like full job is a reporter at Forbes and she's great. I've met her a few times and she's very interesting to talk to, but, um, and obviously she knows a lot about the space, but, uh, but for me, I'm more like I contribute once a month and there's no, uh, there's no real pressure beyond you know, getting an article out one, two times a month, uh, on my side. Uh, so it's a very, it's a very different situation. And the way that I ended up, uh, I ended up joining, uh, joining Forbes. Um, I mean, I had no, I, I had, I, I didn't even really know that Laura Shin was, was was working at Forbes really when I when I first joined, but I I was on a I was on SiriusXM uh, giving a talk at the, on the the Wharton station, and the host that day was not was not in, and so the head editor for the entrepreneurship section of Forbes was replacing him, and so we did this interview. I had a conversation with him. He liked what we were doing kept in touch for six months, maybe a year. And I reached back out and I'm thinking, you know, I want to, I want to get Bitwage written about in Forbes. How do I, how do I do it? So why don't I reach out to this guy? Mm-hmm. And by the end of the conversation, it had gone from, you know, uh, me thinking that I was going to be pitching him on writing about us to him asking me if I wanted to come on as a writer for the entrepreneurship section, since they didn't have a Bitcoin blockchain person for that section. So that's sort of how that came about. I don't know if maybe Laura had a, uh, uh, 
uh, an impact on that. Maybe it did, probably did, since Forbes was already writing about blockchain, so it was on his radar. But uh, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't say, you know, for sure that because of Laura, uh, I got, I got this position. That's a, I call that a successful meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I I really had no idea that was that that was that was going to happen. It's just you know halfway through the conversation, he starts asking me about my writing abilities. I'm like, why are you asking me about my writing abilities right now? <laughs> Aren't you the one that's supposed to write yeah. about? Me? <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, worked out well. Yeah, so you you've I, I was actually kind of curious about your perspective of the space in general because you've been here been around for a while you've been running services in this space mm-hmm. for a while and you've seen this somewhat drastic change in the probably overall sentiment of blockchain in general over the past couple of years how do you view that and how do you how do you, do you see it continuing along this this change of like maybe not so much bitcoin maximalism or do you think it's maybe a a, a current fad yeah, no, it's really it's really interesting because um, when I started working in the space, it was right when the uh, I would say the first real hype around Bitcoin was just starting to die down, right? So, mm-hmm. but yeah, I learned about Bitcoin in the middle of 2013, and you know, started uh, I met my co-founder, and we started sort of coming up with ideas for our project at the end of 2013 and uh uh and so we started we ended up starting in uh 2014 as the price was going from its uh you know height back then of like what you know one thousand dollars which sounds like chump change now um it was nuts yeah and it was it was going it was it was on that slow trend downwards i don't remember but down to like it went down to like two hundred dollars at some point in like 2015 or something like that and uh, and so it, when we started, it was first okay to say the word Bitcoin, and then like by the end of 2014, it was taboo to say the word Bitcoin. Like you you couldn't say the word Bitcoin. Obviously, in R slash Bitcoin, you could, but if you're talking about the startup world, talking to investors, talking to potential partners, talking to banks, what have you, it's you could you, it's blockchain. It, it blockchain all the way like. Uh, Bitcoin is just this little thing that just lets you use the blockchain, right? Uh, it's all about positioning. It's all about how you positioned it to these guys. And this is, you know, blockchain was the hot word. And it was, um, I forget when, maybe towards the, the beginning of 2016, uh, talking to investors and whatnot, that I started to, and, and partners, I started to recognize that uh, even though the price of Bitcoin hadn't, gotten back to a thousand it was maybe around 500 at this time uh bitcoin was starting to become a little bit more in fashion uh people were starting to get a little bit more interesting in it and actually i think that ethereum helped to spark uh some investor and some partner uh interest in bitcoin because what was happening was um people were sort of realizing that you know this private blockchain is taking a long time. We're not really sure if this is going to work out or not. Um, And they start experimenting with ether and then the Dow happened, right? Had this miserable crash and, you know, um, Vitalik and and friends decided to uh, uh, take the money away from the hackers and, and, and give it back to, you know, all these, all the original investors by, uh, by changing the, the, the state of the blockchain. And, and so uh, after that, I actually noticed uh, some enterprises uh, uh, thinking, okay, well, this Ethereum thing might be a little bit shaky right now. Like let's, let's look at, let's look at Bitcoin again, because it's also the, it's also like a, a public blockchain technology. And it was, I think it was actually right around there when I started to realize that, that Bitcoin was, was coming more, in fashion, and now it's it's completely 180. Blockchain is just this overused, overhyped word. Um, you know, uh, using Bitcoin is a much stronger, much stronger word now uh, in 
in uh, you know startup conferences and potential partners and maybe not banks. Banks still hate hate Bitcoin, um, but <laughs> uh, but basically everyone basically everyone else uh, have, have have sort of decided. And, and and I think it's part of it is because of how bastardized the word blockchain has become. Yeah. Um, I I saw this one pitch where a guy was doing some sort of um, some sort of uh, online legal contract um, uh, online legal contract uh, database and he, it, you know the, in the very beginning you see like all the different use cases and one of them is blockchain right but they they don't know what blockchain is and they're not even using a blockchain but uh, now all these people are just throwing the word blockchain in there to say we can work with blockchain. We don't know what it is, but we can definitely work with it. Yeah. And uh, you know, other people claiming that they're they're going to create a blockchain for you, uh, but they don't even understand you know some of the core fundamentals of what makes it valuable. Yeah, so, it's a, it's uh, it's definitely become kind of like I, the way I personally see it. That kind of is, is coming to your point or emboldening your point is that blockchain is a very general term. It could mean almost anything. Especially when it's thrown around in, in, in places that, that people don't understand what a blockchain actually means. And so when, when you pitch Bitcoin, it's, in, it's much, much more narrowed down in what you're talking about and what applications you're particularly focusing on. Yeah, exactly. But not just that, but, but because, the pr- because the, basically the price of Bitcoin gets people excited about it again. Yeah. Um, because... They're seeing lots of users. They see it's an indication of more users coming to coming to the uh, to leverage the technology. And you and then you say, okay, so what's happening in the private blockchain world? Well, no one's come out with anything, and, and all the different companies are fighting over which private blockchain is going to be used. And you know, they're uh, they're 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 still all just doing their 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 prototypes and pilots. And uh, and, and then you look over here to Bitcoin, you're saying, oh, look, this is actually creating value and lots of people are using it right now. Maybe we should actually be focusing on this thing. So um, I, I end up seeing that uh, uh, a good deal. Well, I, this might be a, like a good way to segue into the, your expansion into the UK, just the way the space has been moving in the last two years and the way people are throwing you know, buzzwords like blockchain and you know, I read that you know the, the the UK government they've made some noises about you know turning the country into a, a cryptocurrency friendly environment. You know, how did you overcome this resistance in the past? Like, for example, would you have been able to do this back in like 2014, 2015, or is this you know this time that has passed kind of helped the adoption process a bit to make this happen? So it's still, I'd say that it's still not easy um, because. Uh, and, and it all it all it, it, it comes down to two things, which is uh, one, governments don't understand it, and two, b- banks are afraid of it. Um, th- and this is why it's hard uh, to to do this. I mean, when you think about when you think about uh, the kind of customer uh, uh, someone like our company is to a bank, right? First, you have the fact that we're using Bitcoin. The issue is. Uh, and and that regulators are afraid of it, and the regulators are saying, banks, you figure out what this thing is. Uh, if you if you work with a, a company that's doing Bitcoin, you you got to monitor them, which means that it's going to cost them more to to bank a company like us. So that's one issue. Another issue is uh, is that um, because we're uh, our transa- uh, uh, our transactions are more high velocity as opposed to holding lots of money in an account. Um, they take on more risk and they make less money because all their money they make is by having lots of money held in account for a long time, which is part of why they delay international transactions. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and then the last is we're like cannibalizing one of their one of their business lines, right? Which is which is uh, um, international payments. Which by the way, that's that's like about seventy percent of uh, of our volume is people who are receiving payments internationally. So 30% are, are investors who receive their wages as uh, part of their paycheck. And, and 70% are, are people who uh, like live in like India, but are getting paid from a UK company or live in Brazil and getting paid from a US company. Um, 
But but so so but when you so so back to why banks don't like us, if you think about these three things, we cost more, we're higher risk, and we're cannibalizing one of their business lines. It's like the basically like the worst kind of customer, right? <laughs> that you could possibly have. Uh, and so and so it's incredibly hard. It's not easy. Um, but luckily, uh, we had been doing operations in Ireland for a while, um, and uh, basically our relationships in Ireland uh, were able to open up uh, banking relationships in the UK, uh, and so that's how that happened. And you know, it's, I think it's pretty good timing, right? Um, because now with all the with all the the new interest in the community, uh, the UK. Uh, is traditionally known to not have as strong Bitcoin services as perhaps the EU and the US have. Um, and so we're we're basically bringing you know a higher quality ease of use service to the UK that that previously didn't exist, along uh, to help with the new user growth that's been happening. And uh, I think also from a payment perspective, you think about Brexit and what that might imply for people who are doing the cross border between the UK and the EU. Uh, there's likely going to be a lot more friction on the payment side once they actually leave. And so this can help workers get set up uh, and not have to worry about the uncertainty that will occur uh, after that happens. Um, but, you know, interestingly, you know, when, when you talk about how easy it is for, um, for, uh, for, uh, uh, or, or rather, how the government is now more open to to Bitcoin and blockchain innovation in the UK. It, what, what's interesting about that is uh, so I've uh, I've participated in some talks to uh, to uh, uh, help educate the European Union um, uh, with by by speaking with a, a group of Bitcoin companies to members of the European Parliament and. Uh, you know, I, I found out this insight from one of the one of the lobby groups uh, that apparently I think in I forget what year it was, uh, maybe 2015 or something like that. Uh, the EU was thinking about regulating Bitcoin, putting regulation on Bitcoin, but uh, but that there were there were there were two countries that uh, that uh, opposed it, um, and one of those countries. One of those countries was was Germany uh, because you know they didn't want to give legitimacy to Bitcoin, and the other was the UK because they wanted to actually create a, uh, an innovation ecosystem for Bitcoin and the blockchain in the UK, and they didn't want to have to deal with the pan-European uh, regulation. So it's kind of it's really interesting that they've actually had their 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 mind set on on. Um, on pushing innovation in the Bitcoin blockchain space for for uh, many years now, um, and it's interesting to see this see this happen now. Interesting. Yeah. That's, go ahead, Joel. I, I just want to like comment that I'm just I'm glad that expansion is happening because you know I'm just tired. No matter you know certain parts where you live in the world, you know if you want to pay your bills, you have to use like Bitwalla or Cashilla, or you have to use a third party, you know, like Zappo that is tied to your visa card. It's just very complicated. I'm just glad that you guys are expanding and consolidating and making it easier. And also there's that stigma where, oh, well, the only way to for mass adoption to work is, uh, you know, next is there's going to be the bar in the corner where you, where you can drink your beer and then the grocery store from the other corner and then the bakery and then the rest of the shops. And people are saying, you know, adoption doesn't start from big companies and governments. It starts from your neighbors and friends. But that's just it's so slow. And I'm glad that you guys are kind of taking the opposite approach and you guys are growing, you know, even though there's a lot of resistance. I kind of just feel like you go ahead, Corey. I, I, I want to like add on to that uh, or like uh, I see it somewhat from a different perspective and that the way that the, the, the workforce culture is moving is trending towards being able to do things remotely. Most of the most companies are able to get what they need to get done, provide the services or products they need to offer. And a good portion of what they need to get done can be done remotely from anywhere around the world. And what keeps them from being able to really source from all around the world is paying those people appropriately. And then those people getting whatever cash that, or cash or, or money that they need, they could use in their, in their local place. And BitWage is a facilitator 
of that problem, which means that they're enabling people to be able, like they're including the world in to job and into the workforce of, of places that previously couldn't really employ those types of people based on paying them. Am I, am I, am I wrong in that? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and I, I, th- I, I believe that the world is going to be made of globally distrib- uh, distributed or, or decentralized workforces. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, you're going to, you're going to see a lot of people in Western countries who, you know, want to, want to just be able to work and travel. Uh, and I think that that's going to be facilitated by this. And you're going to see people uh, in uh, different countries who have skill sets that are in demand and can't be met by, by local demand in, in countries that will be connected with these, these companies. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot of pain um, in, in doing the payment. Uh, and what our system does is it makes it as easy as sending and receiving a local, a local transaction, right? Since the company is now just paying another domestic bank account and then we get the money to the workers through the speed and cost of, of Bitcoin, which is pretty, which is pretty great. I mean, sure. It's, it's currently expensive to, to, to buy some coffee with, uh, with a Bitcoin, but, uh, to get your entire wage in it, it's, it's actually incredibly cheap. And, uh, and I actually think this is going to be even more important, uh, in places where, um, you, you basically have a, a lot of distrust in, uh, in your government, um, because where there's distrust in the government, you have volatility in, uh, your home currency. And, you know, I think about the Russian ruble or the Ukrainian Krivna, you think about the Brazilian real, you, um, think about Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela is a mess. You, you know, if you look at the difference between their, their, their black market rates and their, their official rate, it's like $10, 10 Venezuelan Boulevard to the dollar is the official rate. And it's last time I checked, it was like 5,000 Venezuelan Boulevard to the dollar as the unofficial rate. And they're so basically they're paying in, in weight of the money. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure the, the 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 paper itself is much more valuable than the than the the, the government backing of that paper. Um, and and so you know that's why you see uh, people using Bitcoin as a mechanism to to pay to all, you know Venezuela as well as all these other places um, because uh, because either Bitcoin acts as a better store of value uh, uh, than than their own local currency. Um, or they're able to receive uh, more of their money um, than they would through um, the uh, sort of the, the regular means uh, through either a bank wire transfer or Western Union or PayPal or something along those lines. And is the job board that's on your website is that proprietary to Bitwage or is that just kind of like an aggregator that you guys kind of filter through? Okay, so there's actually a pretty big vision for for that uh, that's that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if you know much about uh, like freelance freelance marketplaces um, like Upwork, but basically they're these freelance marketplaces that help you find clients. Um, and you know, if you, if you find if you find a client through the platform, when you get paid, like 10% goes to the to the platform, and uh, and you know, one thing that we we think is uh, sort of a shame. I mean, besides the fact that these platforms tend to not optimize on on the payment side, so you get better, you get worse exchange rates through them. Uh, is that uh, you know, it's it's fairly hard to trust freelancers uh, on the platform because uh, freelancers can lie. Uh, you know, anyone can lie. Um, I'm not saying that the people on the platform are untrustworthy, but uh, by virtue of being in contact with someone in a, another country, it, it, it becomes harder to harder to trust this person. And right now, the current ways that systems are in place uh, is you have to you have to trust a subjective review based system. Um, and uh, and so with, with, uh, 
with what we're doing and by getting payments, I guess, through, through a Bitcoin transaction, this, there's a new concept that, that, that we're sort of bringing about, which is the concept of having a payment reputation, right? Uh, and a payment reputation that you can, you can carry around with you. Uh, so interestingly, you get paid in Bitcoin, you, you have payment reputation on the blockchain and that, and that payment reputation can, can then be used as like a, a verified resume of sorts, right? Um, to, to prove as an international worker that yes, you actually did get paid from the companies that, that you said you did. Uh, since it's, it's a lot harder to prove that when workers are international versus when they're domestic. And so we're building a mechanism so that, uh, so that uh, workers can then have this verified resume, which then lowers the risk uh, for these workers, uh, for, the, for the companies trying to hire them, which means that they're either more likely to get hired or they will be able to command, command higher wages. And, um, and so the idea is to, con- is to uh, connect the workers on our job board with either companies uh, or recruiters who can go and find companies outside of the job board to go and, and hire them. And the reason why this can happen is, you, unlike, uh, unlike other freelance marketplaces, which have closed payment systems that require a company to sign up to pay the worker, our system is open. And that because we provide bank accounts to the workers, they can, they can uh, get paid from any company that they want. And so as a result, uh, as a result, the recruiters can go and find them jobs with like Facebook or Google or or you know big enterprises, right? Um, and uh, and we can make sure that uh, once they get the job and they're getting paid, that everyone in the system, you know, uh, is also able to get paid because we we're able to spin up the bank account, make it easier for the worker to get paid. They get their better exchange rates and their higher wage with this new client. And then us and the recruiter also get paid for enabling this interaction to, to occur. And, mm. and that's something that we're, that we're, that we're sort of, uh, it, it, we're, we're building right now and have like the, the MVP for it. Uh, we've got workers signed up and we're, we're getting them, we're, we're just starting to get them jobs. It's really interesting. I'm trying to like wrap my brain around that and how it could move forward in terms of kind of, becoming a decentralized reputation system and, and system of inclusion for people with skill to get connected with people in need. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's, you have this somewhat level of, uh, like in order to have reputation on a blockchain, like provable by a blockchain, you need to deobfuscate a lot of information about the payments being sent to that individual and who they've interacted with, which, which kind of goes against some of the ideology in which people use blockchain for in the first place. And like the like recommended use cases of being paid in Bitcoin is to use a new address every single time. But if you want to build up this reputation, you can't do certain practices like that. You have well, like, you can pr- you can still you can still. So the thing is that uh, you can you can basically show the information to who you want, right? Okay. Yeah. So so selective uh, deobfuscation, if you will. Exactly. <laughs> selective deobfuscation, as opposed to as opposed to just here it is, check it out, right? Yeah. So like our system, our system is basically going to make it so that you don't have to look to the blockchain to, to, sort, of, to sort of see it, uh, to, to see the reputation. But if you wanted to, you could always just go to the blockchain, right? And deobfuscate uh, to a particular person that you want to, you want to show it to uh, in case they're, they're, you know, they really want to dig into the weeds of, of that proof. I guess the next question for that is, is, does that reputation rely on your platform or is it something that could be ported um, very easily outside of, of having to go through you? Well, uh, so I guess the, 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 there's, two, there's two main reasons why you would have to go through our platform. One is because uh, we verify who the sender is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and the other is that we make it we basically make it so that it's it's easy to read and easy to understand. So those yeah. are the two main values. But technically, you know, uh, you can always prove that you got paid into that into that address, um, and it's just a matter of 
being able to prove who the send, who the sender is. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and so if the sender wants to keep that anonymous, then you would basically need to use our platform to selectively deobfuscate the sender and the receiver. Uh, but if they were more open to releasing that information, um, then you could do it off our platform. I think the beauty in a lot of this is the fact that you said um, if they decide they'd like to disclose that information, mm-hmm. if you know, the, the endpoints are the ones of the power here as opposed to the central nodes. Like, you're, like what you're providing is a service for people to mm-hmm. make decisions for themselves as opposed to um, making them for them. Exactly. And I think, I, and I, I think that there's a lot of potential for, for decentralizing a, a lot of this stuff, a lot of the other elements of it. Um, but, you know, uh, our take on a lot of these decentralized apps is, is that uh, it's better to create a centralized version of the app first uh, to ensure that there's actually like a, um, you know, a, a market and a value proposition before, before decentralizing it. Um, because you may find, you may find you know, one that is actually better for your system to be centralized instead of decentralized. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's better for something to be centralized, right? Um, because there's efficiencies in centralization. Um, while there's, while there's, uh, essentially, uh, decentralization is the main efficiency is removing, removing intermediaries. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, the, you know, I, uh, I think that the, 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 the real thing is to try and actually create like a working business model first and then test to see one, will it make more sense for it to be decentralized? And two, you know, is there actually a business model to start out with? Um, I think that those are, those are two very important things before actually going out and, 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 and proposing to, to create a decentralized platform, even if there are, you know, tens of millions of dollars that'll get thrown out, thrown your way for, for basically not having anything, but you know, that's basically why you see the majority of the things being built now are just disrupting current, obviously profitable business models with adding decentralization where it could possibly make a difference. Yeah. So, I mean, like you, I, I think it's important to, to remember what is the, what's the value of decentralization, right? Cause it's, there are, there are, there are ta- there are issues with decentralization, right? Mm-hmm. So, so upgrading a system is much harder in decentralization. It is incredibly hard to upgrade a platform. So, if there is a bug uh, or a security flaw, uh, it becomes way harder to uh, ensure the security of that system when it's decentralized, right? Um, and so that's that's like a very important thing to keep in mind, um, and. In terms of, uh, in, in, I, I, I think that a lot of uh, a lot of platforms can almost be done in a in a centralized way. So, like, so if you think about like the value of a smart contract, like what is what is actually the value of a smart contract? And I would propose that the value of a smart contract is to do things in a decentralized environment that are almost as efficient as what can be done in a centralized environment. Um, and then it's just a question of, and then it's a question of, okay, so then is having the decentralization, removing the intermediary, basically creating enough value to, uh, to account for the loss of the speed at which you can reiterate and update the platform. Um, and if, if the answer is yes, uh, then then it makes sense to create a decentralized platform, right? I think I think like Augur is a great example of uh, a platform that re- that that actually makes sense to be decentralized. Bitcoin is a great example of a platform that makes sense to be decentralized. Uber, I'm not convinced, uh, is a, a a great uh, example of uh, 
what uh, uh, something that would be de- good to be decentralized or not. Um, you might argue that that because of Uber centralization, it would be able to outcompete uh, a decentralized platform. But I guess you might be able to argue that uh, because. Uh, the platform is decentralized. You'll actually have multiple companies sharing all the liquidity of the of the of, of, of the drivers, um, and so that might have a stronger network effect to get more drivers on the platform or something like that. Um, but uh, but overall, but overall, I think that you know, uh, uh, just because something is decentralized doesn't necessarily make it uh make it better yeah hello cory anything to add no i think i can't i can't i'm I'm, I'm thinking about all of that it's a sorry for the silence there i couldn't agree more (laughs) basically is what i can come up with right now is like that based on all of that there is it's it's there's certain efficiency gains and losses and there's, it's definitely an incentive optimization when you, when you go through deciding what you're building and how you're building it and whether or not decentralization needs to be a part of it. Um, mm-hmm. And I just, like, coming full circle back, I appreciate when people make tools that allow people to make those decisions instead of being relegated to something of, of a single decision. So like before blockchain, we, were, we, we didn't have the choice to make these types of decisions and how we're going to build our businesses or how we'd like to fund things or how we're going to build these systems. Um, now we do, which enables a larger scope of uh, kind of interactions between a customer and the service they use. It, and, it, and it's you services know, like yours that enable that type of thing. It's what I'm trying to get to. So like, I appreciate that. And that's kind of the movement that I like to see is it enabling people to make the choice that they would like to make as opposed to just, being confined within a narrow range of choices. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you do make an interesting point, right? Uh, but w- one thing that I that I do find really interesting is, is this concept of uh, ICO. Uh, I, I don't think that ICOs are just going to all be for decentralized platforms at some point, because uh, you know there's two values of an ICO. Uh, you have the de- the ability to work within a decentralized platform, and then there's just tradability in and of itself. Just like making making uh, elements of your platform more tradable, um, and I think that uh, I think that even though there's the ICO craze is is out of control uh, right now, uh, you know you look at you look and you know there's there's a billion dollars of value in things that don't exist, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you have to think, okay, that's, that sounds a little crazy, um, but uh, but uh, but I think that I think that. The, the concept itself of uh, basically creating uh, a digital token that is tradable, uh, not just stuck on your platform, while also being able to uh, purchase services or goods on your platform. Um, you know, it's, it's basically the same thing as a Kickstarter, except for if you decide that instead of, if you, you'd like to get out of your, you get like to get out of, uh, your position into your, in your Kickstarter that you invest into, you can trade it off, and and that just that just sounds valuable to me, um, and, and I, I I can't see why why that wouldn't uh, be isn't going to be valuable for for people in the future. Yeah, it's like a it's like a, a little kid getting a brand new toy, and he's just incredibly over exuberated about his new toy. So it's like fuck yeah, new toy. And he spends all time playing with it, and for a while, it just and then over time, he it loses a little bit of interest and uses it for what it's actually good for, right? Uh, and yeah. the, the crypto community just got a brand new toy, and they're playing with it as much as possible to see what part of their lives they can incorporate this toy into. And it's going to take a while for that to kind of wear off. Yep, yep, I I agree, and uh, you know, I uh, I. You know, far, far be it from me to, to to give trading advice, but I do think I do think that if you know, uh, at some point there's going to be a uh, uh, some sellings of of uh, of uh, ICO and of uh, of Ether holdings, and 
uh, I think the whole a lot of the market is gonna is gonna feel a big shock. When, <laughs> the uh, reckoning when is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we'll see. Uh, I think that's a, a great way to kind of, kind of wrap this up. Do you, Chell, is there something else you want to add? Kind of want to hit him with the ten question, the ten word. Since it's been two years, it's been two years. That may have changed. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, um, are you able to explain the blockchain in ten words or less? In ten words or less? Oh, okay. Let's see. Um, well, well, uh, the way that I describe a blockchain is essentially a database that's distributed among more than a single node and has a consensus mechanism for updating it. Oh, like well, a, you killed it with that last say part. And. Yeah, you say <laughs> and. <laughs> yeah, All right. yeah, yeah. Based on that, let's, let's, let's do something new here. Can you explain Bitcoin in 10 words or less? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, how, do you, how do you explain Bitcoin in, in 10 words or less? Um, let's see. Uh, a non-technical way would be the uh, sort of the uh, uh, probably I would describe it as uh, the the easiest to use uh, and the easiest to store, but the easiest commodity to use and store that uh, the world's ever seen. That's ten words. All right. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not Thank wait another guys. two years to bring you back on. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Sounds like point. And that was the interview with Jonathan Chester from BitWage, where you can get paid in crypto. You just have to go through a bunch of steps, and they don't make it painfully easy to do it. Yeah, I know we just interviewed you, Jonathan, but I hope you're listening when I tell you your site is not easy to navigate. Really? I went, have you used I it? I went to it. Yeah. I tried to use when? it when I started. It was actually easier to navigate. Two years ago, I've been with BitWage. I've been trying to get paid in Bitcoin for two years. Remember when I was tutoring with that company? And they were like, oh, we're so ass backwards. We don't even know what a Bitcoin is. And we might fire you for asking. And I was like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then I tried with this company. And they're like, yeah, man, you can send your money wherever you want to. And I was like, cool. So I go to BitWage last week, and I'm like, hell yeah, they still got my account. Hell yeah, they got all that stuff that I did. And then I'm like, how do I navigate this sea of confusion? Yeah, there, that bad. it I seemed fine to me. Go to it. Go to it right now. I want you to go to it right now and try and figure out what you put where to get your money to spit out in Bitcoin. Because I was lost. I was playing with you the other day. It, didn't, it seemed that didn't seem that big of a deal at all. I want you to. I, I go to I'm going to bitwage.com, and the first thing I see is trabajos y sueldos para trabajadoras en el extranjero. What the hell are Why you is talking it in about? Spanish. You Why got is issues, dude. Spanish? I don't know. Check your computer. Maybe I don't know where you're going. <laughs> I'm signed up. I just signed up. Okay, so I'm going to dot go com. Just going to bitwage.com. And for whatever reason, under the sun, last okay, I did this two nights ago. It you need was to turn off that extension fine. that turns everything to Spanish. Bittrapaho.com. That's weird because I'm on bitwage.com. And it, anyways, jobs and wages, sign up. I don't want to sign up. I want to log in because I I have an account here. And I've done business. I'm not going to go through this shit. On I'm doing chat. it right now. I'm Anyways, getting an access code. Yeah, it's going to your phone. Yeah, but then there's like, look. Okay. Keep talking. Hey, guys. Great, great service. Keep look, talking. Well, you, guys are... talk, you talk about something. I'm going to sign up while you talk. You can All sign right. up, but it ain't going to be painfully easy to figure out how to get your paycheck to get converted to Bitcoin. Okay, y'all, y'all start talking. I'll, 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 I will put it through the test. Hey, D. Yes, I got a question up? for you. Up, ICOs, the new scam, or the better way to raise capital? 
go. ICO is a better way to raise capital. But it's potentially uh, a very bad scam. For some they're, people they're that are potentially that potentially taxable income as well. Look, this is this is what I say for an ICO. I would say that if you have a viable product and you have a very transparent steps to why you need the funding that you have, then an ICO is an excellent way to essentially expose yourself to public investing so that you can have the funding to do the things you need. I think that's great. Uh, it's basically got like crowdfunding on crack. But if you don't have anything and you're just like, okay, here is a uh, here's hefty garbage garbage can coin. And what we do is if you buy tokens a hefty garbage can coin, then you get access to a network where we have a camera that looks at hefty garbage bags. Like what? What is that? What are you doing? You know, so I think that it's a it's an excellent abstraction for people that have cryptocurrency, mainly Ether, to invest in up and coming businesses. Yeah, but selling digital tokens is like no different than a mobile game selling digital gold. They can't consider digital gold a capital raise. So why should an ICO be considered one? It's not the same thing. Uh I think it is. We need to add on to this at a different show. We're talking about ICOs for a specific reason, though, right, Corey? We were talking about it before the show. This episode is like two hours long. I gotta stop. Yeah, I, gotta stop. I gotta pay attention because I'm trying to go through this this bit wage thing. I'm in the external invoicing time. setup. It's confusing as hell. And that's why it's taking you a long time. But keep going for it. <laughs> Three minutes. Dude. Yeah, ICOs are. Why are you ICOs, shitting all over our guests after an hour? I think they're a great I'm not, service. Sh- I'm not shitting on the guests. I think it's an amazing service. What I'm saying is that their website is confusing. It is not straightforward. Like, I know how it works. I send you a bank routing slash account number, and you and when I get paid, right? So, so if I, I go to my employer and I say, "Hey, you know how you're direct depositing money to this routing and bank account number?" Now I would like you to also take a percentage of my checks and direct deposit it to this bank account and routing number. And then here, Bitwage is going to take that money and they are going to exchange it for crypto and then send it to a wallet of my choosing. I get all that. I explain that really fast. It should be not that much slower for me to set all that up. So basically what just happened... Or what I'm at now, as they say, there's two parts. Part one is com- is basically complete your employment status. And then part two is, let's see, I didn't say what part two is. And wait two business days for approval. If approved, we will give you a bank account set up in your requested payroll currency to invoice to your client. So that people know what, to, what type of bank account in what country they know to send money to. Which they then handle and route it according to whatever your standards are once you have it set up. I can't say anything about their standards once you have it set up because I haven't done that. So it looks like you need to set up whatever you need to set up for each individual I could be wrong here, each individual invoicing that you'd like to do. But it doesn't seem that difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it's way more difficult than saying, put send money to this Bitcoin address. But some people can't do that. And if you want to work overseas, whoa, that is okay. not my bag. That's my niece. That you want to mute your microphone wild. like you always tell Cello to do. I mute that hear baby. The last second, my bad. Hold, let me mute this. So now, if you're in the UK and you like Wallace and Gromit, you can now use Bitwage. Congratulations. <laughs> I think okay. that's. What else do we have to we, talk about? We were going to talk about how we're tired of shitty ICOs hitting our inbox and asking us to talk about them. Well, it's not even shitty ICOs. It's like, I don't want this podcast to be, guess who, guess who hit our inbox last week? Like we're getting, we're getting flooded with people trying to, trying to get time on this network to talk about whatever thing they're happening. And the majority of them don't have products. I don't want to talk to anybody that doesn't have a product anymore. I'm tired of it. It's 
It's like, I don't, I don't even want to talk to someone who's trying to solicit us to talk to them. We used to pick our guests from all disparate, like disparate parts of the cryptocurrency community. Yeah. And, and interview them because we were interested in what they were doing. And we got to get different viewpoints across the entire community. And lately it's just been who's hit our inbox. Yeah. And I, I don't want to do that anymore. Like we, we can send those people to announcements. With I know, me. I know what happened. I think I could, I think I found the solution is that we were in this in the beginning, the forums that we would go to and the people that we'd speak to is really genuine because it wasn't as big as it was. There wasn't, as much at risk and now it just seems like those almost political factions but uh, I, I one of my favorite episodes we ever done was when we talked to that farmer from australia and he was like <laughs> the chicken farmer he was like yeah the chicken farmer and he goes yeah i love i love bitcoin i don't have an australian name. i'm not even try he just loved bitcoin and he was trying to get all the other farmers around him to use bitcoin because it would make their lives easier but you know, I, I don't know where he is. I'd like to check up on him, but that was one of my favorite episodes. And we can't do stuff like that anymore because anytime I get on the forums that we used to go to, it's just like, Roger Ver is literally Satan. And then you go to another forum and they're like, <laughs> oh, the Bitcoin core is a hive mind. And they all circle jerk onto cupcakes. Eat them. And you're like, well, that's, that's why I'm getting going retired on? porn star Kenny Styles back on the show. That's oh, what I yeah. mean. That's what I mean, though. Like, let's get back. Let's get back to what we used to do. And if we want to, if we want to, I guess, answer to people who are trying to push stuff, we'll just throw them in announcements. Are, are, are one of our sub shows that I do. It's a really easy yeah. way for me to be like, hey, man, what problem are you solving? Why does blockchain fix it? What have you done? Where are you going? Cool. Here's some details. We can do that. Yeah. And it's easy. But it's, it's, in my opinion, not nearly as interesting as us going and talking to the people that we actually want to talk to. And I think our like, listeners started listening to us because... We gave them a different perspective than everyone else did. And right now, I think we've gotten away from that. Yeah, we're going to get back to that. And if looking you're hitting our... You, yeah. No. Looking at you. I don't want to talk to Lil B. Bitcoin, Bitcoin let's get a, is let's love. Let's get a real rapper. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Bitcoin is love. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, well, let's wrap this up, man. It's been a really long episode. Thank you guys for listening again. Um... Of course, if you're still interested, you can tweet hashtag this is why. Uh, let us know why you listen so we can get better at that and not why you don't listen. Like people that don't listen, go away. But do listen, tell us why you listen. Better at that. Well, you said something interesting. You said, I wonder what our non fans think of us. And that's, that's a really weird question because that's like, you know. What are those people that don't know La- we exist? Think about yeah. us. Lady Gaga is not like, I wonder what the people who don't listen to my music think of me. You know what I mean? We can only hear feedback from our fans. I think. No, you're not wrong, but I wanted to know. This is what I meant by non-fan. When, when earlier in the Slack, I was like, hey guys, there's this post on Reddit. I want you guys to go in there see, say some stuff and see what we shake up. But I was like, alright, I'll say some stuff. I wanted to see if somebody was like, no, I hate the Bitcoin podcast because all they talk about is Street Fighter. And that's stupid. It's not Bitcoin at all. And then I would understand, okay, that's the kind of lame ass that we don't appeal to. I just want to know exactly <laughs> how lame that person was. That's all. I, I, yeah, there I was, are people I, that have listened to us that don't get it, that, that don't like us, right? Even one of the guys yeah. in our Slack said he used to not like us. Then we broke away from Coin Telegraph, and now he likes us. Like, yeah. uh, like there are people that have listened to us and be like, "No, nope, not for me," and then walk away. Which cool, but I, I would like to get their feedback so I can at least take it into consideration when we're making other things. I wouldn't take it that much in consideration. I just call them pabs and keep it moving. All right, well, that's it. For today's shows, um, if you're doing an ICO and you hit the inbox like, we've got the next greatest blockchain ever, then you're going to have to pay. Suck a D. You're going to you're gonna, <laughs> We're probably not going to email you back that, but you're going to have to pay. And we're, we're, you're going to come on TPP announcements. Corey's going to grill you. Corey's going to say, like, all right, that's that blockchain. Care? That's what they're doing. Like, that's it. 
So we're going to let this be painstakingly clear. If, if you got a blockchain, some sort of ICO, and you're like, this ICO is going to change a uh, diaper selling industry forever, then you're going to pay for Corey's time to talk to you, figure out what the hell you're doing, because we're tired of that. So um, we're going to wrap this up real quick at the PTC podcast on Twitter. Tweet us, um, talk to us. We'll talk back. Join the Slack at the big podcast.com slash the sign up team. Fuck it. Go to the Bitcoin podcast.com and click the Slack button and then follow the instructions. Can't make it to the Slack. You never were meant to be there. Um, let's see. What else do we got? At DBTC podcast, Twitter, find us on iTunes, find us on everything else. Just yeah, Google, just Google, Google. Bitcoin podcast. Google us. It, that's us. It's really yeah, simple. That's us. Bitcoin podcast network, adding shows, getting awesome. Uh, shout out to Zoe Saldana. Shout out to whoever made the chicken wings tonight. They're going to be just, um, Oh, and hola, como estas? We will be at DevCon 3 in Mexico. Yeah, see us. we're going to be there. We're going to be wearing uh, funny shirts and doing interviews and stuff. That's coming right, up well, in, coming up soon. No, noviembre? Siempre. Septiembre? Gucci. Wait, that's in September? I thought it was in November. November. November 1st. We're flying in on Halloween. Oh, snaps. All right. Well, um, play. Shout out to Zoe Saldana. Play the outro.